seem like we have quite a few people here, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Melanie Ganey. I'm a librarian with CMU Library, supporting some of our science and engineering departments and a lot of our open science and data initiatives as well. And I'm here with Luli Wong, who is our postdoctoral fellow for data curation at CMU Libraries. And together, we are helping to organize this Rediviz trial. Um, we're trialing the Rediviz platform for the next year and a half, and it can be used for research and instruction purposes. And we will be having a demo today to go over all that functionality, um, help you decide whether you want to try out the platform. And so I'm going to turn it over to Ian Matthews, the co-founder and CEO of Rediviz, who will do the demo. And then at the end, we'll um, talk about next steps for the trial. I'll be monitoring the chat. If you have any questions, feel free to put those in the chat. Um, and we are recording this session, so you can um, send it along to colleagues who may have missed it after, and we'll email it out as well. Wonderful. Um, thank you for, for having me here today. Um, with that, I will dive into it. Um, so, um, so yeah, so Rediviz, uh, Rediviz for, for research, and we'll kind of talk a little bit today also about its um, utility as, as an instructional tool. Um, my name is Ian Matthews. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Rediviz. Um, as a very brief background, um, our mission in Rediviz is to enable research groups to distribute rich data sets and to provide scientists with the tools to understand them. We strive to do this in a way that reduces barriers to working with data um, and that develops intuitive tools that make data science as accessible and reproducible as possible. Um, today, we work with several thousand uh, researchers kind of scattered across the country as well as a bit internationally. Um, we're used institution-wide at several AGS universities and various uh, labs and research centers across the country. We're very specifically focused on this use case of working with research data in an academic context um, and to that end, our product development is continuously informed by our research community. And you know, our hope is that over the course of this pilot, um, your feedback is the most valuable thing to us. And we can really kind of work together to continue to evolve the platform and make it meet uh, the specific needs of your work. So with that, much of um, what I'll do today is just a, a walk through the platform, and then we can kind of get into Q&A and, and do some deeper dives. Um, to ground us, uh, you can think of it as, as a comprehensive data platform. It's a place where you can either upload or discover data sets, where you can configure and apply for access to restricted data sets, and where you can ultimately perform your analysis. Um, that said, it is not a closed platform. We have an open API, um, and kind of any you know, step of this process could be replaced with alternate um, tooling or, or workflows. Um, yeah, we, we never want it to be a closed platform, but we also want it to be something that um, is comprehensive, a place where you can do um, kind of your entire um, data research work. So with that, I'm going to kind of step through these in tandem. Um, and to begin, we can talk a little bit about data set discovery um, and data set management on Rediviz. Um, so data sets are created by individual researchers um, uploaded to their personal workspace or within uh, what we call an organization. An organization could be a research lab, it could be a large research center at Carnegie Mellon and kind of all else in between. Uh, Rediviz supports tabular, geospatial, and unstructured data sets of effectively arbitrary, uh, arbitrary size. Um, and we have um, automatic issuance of things like DOIs built in, version control and supported reproducibility, as well as affordances for rich metadata, documentation, and auto-generated statistics. So with that, um, we'll do a kind of a, a walkthrough of the Stanford Institution on Rediviz. Um, Carnegie Mellon also does have its own landing page at rediviz.com slash CMU. Um, it's a bit of a placeholder right now, but excited for some data sets and, and groups to get in here. Um, and then we can start demoing with CMU data. Um, so backing up here, this is the Stanford uh, University Institution on Rediviz. Um, this is kind of a landing page. They branded it the Data Farm. Um, and we can see some various organizations that are hosting um, data at the institution um, and also kind of explore um, data sets that are that are hosted on Rediviz across Stanford. So you know, if we want to look for demographic data, we can pull this up and see some, some different data sets that are, are being hosted here. If we know the particular research group that we want to work with, um, we can go to their data portal. Um, so for example, this is the landing page for the Stanford Center for Population Health Sciences. Um, I imagine some people on this call represent particular you know, research labs or groups that would want to kind of have their own 
their own landing page, their own kind of branded data portal. Um, so this is something that you could configure within the Carnegie Mellon Institution. Um, here we can see some kind of top level um, information about this organization, the sorts of data that they host. Um, and we can also, again, browse across their various data sets. And I'm wondering if my internet's conking out. But I still see you. Funny. Okay, it's bad. Sorry, I've been having some internet issues today. Fingers crossed. Um, okay, so um, so we can browse um, across uh, the the uh, data sets in this organization. Um, so, uh, for example, let's say that um, we want to look like there's a lot of medical data in here that is obviously fairly high risk, um, but they also have some environmental um, data sets. So let's say that we want to look for um, precipitation trends in the U.S. Say we can search across all these data sets um, for any that match precipitation. This does a fairly deep search, so it's not just looking at um, kind of like top level documentation, um, but really going into the data sets, metadata, value labels. This term matched specifically on the element variable um, within this daily observations table. And if we look at the bottom right here, we can see that the PRCP value um, we matched on precipitation, um, and we have close to a billion uh, records of measuring precipitation in this data set. On this table, we can kind of learn a bit more about the data. Um, if I really just want to touch the data, I can go into the cells view here um, and view kind of um, you know the, the the content that's making up this table. It's obviously quite large. It's close to three billion records. Um, this particular data set goes back to the um, 1760s, uh, 250 years. Um, we can explore these univariate summary statistics and get a sense um, for the date distribution and, and, and realize that you know, the data is more concentrated in the more more recent era. When we want to dive further into a data set, uh, we can navigate to the data set page. Um, this is a place where um, a researcher can learn more about a particular data set, or if you're the data owner, where you kind of imbue all sorts of documentation, metadata. Um, as I mentioned, Reddit is automatically issues DOIs. Um, this is through DataSight. Um, we populate um, the DOI metadata with all sorts of information about contributors to that data set, related identifiers, um, what have you. So that people ultimately can get credit for their work. Um, we can see that this data set is populated with various methodological information here. We can also explore the other tables in this data set. Um, so uh, ultimately, we'll do a little kind of uh, uh, geospatial map um, with these data sets, look at precipitation trends. Um, so uh, we want to validate that we do have um, um, uh, geospatial dispersion data. This exists in a stations table where we can see we have the latitude and longitude encoded. Um, and Reddit is, does things like auto generate uh, certain summary statistics um, based on geospatial information. So we can see kind of the, the dispersion of this data set, um, largely concentrated in the United States, but it is a global data set. The last thing I just wanted to highlight on this page is that all data sets on Reddit is are version controlled. Um, you can see that we're looking at version 1.2 of this data set right now. But I can go back over time. I can see what's changed between versions. We can see in version 1.1, a new year's worth of data was uploaded here. Um, important, importantly, historic versions never change. So if you've been working off of version 1.1 of this data set, um, you can continue running your analysis in perpetuity, get the same exact results, but you also have an easy upgrade path to begin working with, um, with newer versions of the data. Um, additionally, Reddit is, is storing kind of an efficient row-level diff across versions. We're not duplicating the data with every version, but really just keeping track of, of what's changed to minimize um, uh, storage costs across versions. So this was a brief tour of um, a tabular data set um, with some geospatial elements as well. Um, we do support a uh, diversity of data types, um, so I'm going to pop over to our demo organization just to showcase um, a little bit more on the different data sets we support. Um, to start, we, we do have full support for, um, for geospatial data. Um, this is a forest fires um, data set um, where um, uh, we've uploaded um, shape files that were um, pulled down from the, from the fire service around uh, US fire perimeters. Um, we support shape files, GeoJSON, KML. Um, and uh, well, what happens is um, every feature uh, in uh, in the, the geography file, um, it gets encoded as a single row in a table. But importantly, we have all of the polygon information here um, that you can kind of pull up um, to uh, further inspect it. And then uh, we have all sorts of tooling that supports things like geospatial joins and, and what have you as, as well. 
And then finally, um, we do support basically um, any other file type uh, through non-tabular or unstructured data. Um, so you can upload um, any file that um, wouldn't say fit into a table into this uh, files tab um, on the on the data set page. Um, we do have built in previews for a, a wide array of different file types. Um, so obviously things like uh, images and TIFF files, uh, we can show inline previews to um, to kind of the end user. Um, but we also um, kind of more obscure file formats, uh, CIF and PDD are for um, proteins and molecular structures. Um, so we have kind of a an open source viewer that we've been able to port in here for exploring um, this particular file format um, or things like HDF5, HDF5 files, um, which are fairly common from um, instrument recordings and what have you. If this is going to load here, but if not, we'll move on. This one's a bit bigger. Um, cool. So, um, so that's kind of a, a brief tour of um, data sets. Do, Melanie, does it make sense? Should we kind of take questions as we go, or, or do we think it's better just to hold off until the, the end? Um, I guess we Sorry. could just pause for a second and see if anybody has any questions so far. I haven't seen anything in the chat. OK, I guess we're good to keep going. Cool. Um, all right, so um, those are data sets. Um, I wanted to take a brief aside here um, to talk about uh, data ingest, since I think this is going to be relevant for a lot of people on the call. Um, it's a little less exciting, but it's a crucial um, component of all of this. Um, so Reddit supports a diversity of file types um, that can be uploaded either through the interface or through the API. Um, in um, terms of tabular files, uh, a wide variety of formats, so obviously things like CSVs and TSVs, um, Excel files you can throw in. Um, we also support some more kind of obscure formats like the SAS, SPSS, and SCADA data formats um, and allow adjusting those with um, their full metadata and value labels and stuff like that. Um, with respect to geospatial data, um, you can ingest shape files, GeoJSON, KML. And then as we saw with um, unstructured data, you can basically upload um, any file type. Um, this system is designed to ingest really from wherever the data reside. So obviously that's on your local computer or a server. You can push it directly to Redivis, um, but you can, we have um, kind of built-in connectors to things like Box and Amazon S3, GCS, uh, Google Drive, what have you, um, to, to pull in the file. Um, and then we have robust tooling that allows for you to transform your data, to UTL your data, um, to stack multiple files into one table, um, something that we see fairly commonly is, you know, you'll have uh, one CSV per year, and you want to kind of concatenate those into a single table, um, uh, complete with robust type in inference and, and versioning. Um, and then again, tools that allow for you to manage metadata, documentation, identifiers, things like that on a data set. So to walk through the creation of a um, of a data set, we're going to go to the demo organization and we will create a new data set. When we initially create a data set, we can choose um, kind of its access classification. Um, I'll get more into this in a moment. Um, notably, when the data set first gets created, it's unpublished. So um, this access classification doesn't really apply um, until the data set is released. But um, what this is going to do is it will give anybody in the world access to the metadata for this data set, but they will have to apply for access to um, get access to the data. Um, so we're dropped into this data set editing interface, um, and this is where we can upload tabular data, geospatial data, as well as those non-tabular files. Um, to start, maybe I'll create um, a tabular data table here. Um, and again, we can import from a bunch of different um, sources. Um, I'll actually just pull some files in from Google Drive. Um, in part because you can actually see while I screen share, also because my internet's a little off. Um, so in here we can pull in, um, this is kind of like the SQL pedal length data set, um, but it's with penguins. Um, so it automatically determines the file type based on the ending. Um, but again, you can provide, um, you can specify um, any file type here and you can have settings for weird things that can happen with the limited files. Uh, but generally you'll find that our um, Auto predictor is quite robust. Um, so we can import this tabular file. And while that's going, um, I can leave the page now. There's nothing happening kind of on my computer. This is all happening in the cloud. Um, but I can also go ahead and upload the geospatial table. 
And again, we will pull in from Google Drive. Um, a GeoJSON file. Um, once that import has completed, um, we can inspect our, our table. We can validate um, that you know things look as we expect. We can click on um, different variables to look at the univariate summary statistics and make sure that things are just generally um, passing the snuff test or, or aligned with our expectations. Um, and same thing for, for geospatial data. Um, and so this is um, a bunch of US states. Um, and so we can see the geometries that we pulled in here. And then finally, we can also upload non-tabular files. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pull in um, some pictures of cats and dogs from um, on Google here. Um, I am a folder, and we can import this. Let's call it cats and dogs. I am using Google Drive to um, ingest uh, data here. I'll mention that Google Drive is actually not a great tool for this. Their API is pretty limited and they'll throttle things. Um, and, and generally, um, if you're transferring terabytes of data, I would not recommend doing it through Google Drive. Um, but it's kind of fun for the, the sake of the demo here. Actually, while that's uploading, we do have a question in the chat. Right. Um, do you want me to read it or are you able to see the chat? Uh, I have it up now, but... Um, I can read it. Yeah, yeah. Is the geospatial map feature something that is part of Rediviz? If there are other data visualization types or features we would like, is there a space for plugins, or would that be something the Rediviz team would develop? Yeah, so um, I guess going back to these um, example data files, so um, uh, these are all kind of designed to be pluggable um, right now. So all, all of the different uh, file viewers here. Um, so. Um, let's see if the HDFI file will load here. Um, so this is all designed to be pluggable. Um, and right now these are all managed by the right of this team. Uh, but if there's a new file format that you would like to kind of develop a previewer for, we'd love to work with you on that. Um, and in the future, you could definitely imagine a world where maybe we can um, we can make the system uh, allow for kind of like third party applications. Um, there we go. Um, so for example. Um, and then there's also, I'll get into in a little bit, there's kind of a notebooks interface as well, where you could, of course, you know, have the full, you know, affordances of the Python and R toolkit um, where you could build visualizations in there. All right. I think our, our cats and dogs have finished here. You know, I'm, I'm sorry, everyone. I'm just going to hop over to my cell phone for internet because this is not the right way to do a presentation. No worries. <clears throat> Matt, Melanie, am I in the call here? Yes. Yes. Okay. And that's coming through. I, I'm really sorry about that. This just started happening this morning. Um, so, um, so yeah, so here we have um, kind of our, our non-tabular um, uh, data that had been um, pulled in, a bunch of images of cats and dogs. Well, we have a backup here um, that I put together. Um, so we have a bunch of images of cats and dogs here. Um, that um, that have been loaded as as non-tabular files. Um, what's nice about this is that the um, files can also be kind of indexed within um, a table. Um, so in a case where you have millions of files, um, each file contains its um, uh, contains a unique file identifier, and you can basically reference um, these these images, these non-tabular files, as if they existed within a table, and run all sorts of uh, queries and analyses against them. All right, um, so that was the, the data ingest interface. Um, and now I wanted to hop over to quickly talk about access management. Um, you can definitely host um, fully public data sets in Rediviz, um, but it is a HIPAA compliant SOC certified interface or platform. 
that is designed to store PHI. Um, data owners um, can configure tiered access to um, data sets that are hosted on Rediviz. One of the biggest pain points we heard early on um, with uh, working with restricted data is that researchers often um, couldn't see anything about a data set until they had jumped through all these hoops to gain access. So the idea behind the system is that you can maybe make the metadata or at least some of the documentation about a data set fairly available while um, restricting access to the underlying data and protecting you know, patient privacy or, or confidentiality. Data owners in the system define requirements that must be fulfilled for different tiers of access. Um, and you can use these requirements to collect and store documentation. So things like signed DUAs, what have you. Um, and of course, this is all tracked in comprehensive searchable audit logs. So um, to pull up a quick example here, um, this is this is kind of a very, um, very complex example um, for a fairly high risk data set um, that is managed by the Stanford Center for Population Health Sciences. But I think it's illustrative of some of the, the flexibilities of the system. So what you'll see here is that overview access to this data set is public. Um, anybody can go to this page, they can see that the data set exists, um, and they can see some of its documentation. Uh, metadata access for this particular data set is somewhat locked down, um, so people have to be a member of the Stanford community, they have to fill out a conflict of interest attestation, um, various other forms, um, and again, this is highly customizable, these are really just forms that are defined by the data owner. Um, and then finally, in order to get data access, um, there's a slew of additional requirements that have been defined here. Um, so the whole idea is, as a researcher, it's very easy for me to see what I need to do to gain access to this data set and whether I will be able to. Um, and for the data owner, you can really define, you know, the kind of have a process driven system um, for people to apply for access to, to a data set um, and, and kind of collect the relevant documentation as you go. One other thing to note here, um, which is uh, relevant for some of the high risk data sets is when somebody does have access to the data, um, you can define additional uh, data export rules. Um, very often it's a case where, you know, we don't want people to be able to download a data set to their computer once they have access because kind of the cat's out of the bag with respect to security at that point. Um, so you could say, um, define that, you know, uh, exports are only a allowed on admin approval. So you can validate that the table being exported doesn't contain any PHI. Or in this case, we see that, that they do allow export to certain on-premise systems at Stanford, um, but a researcher couldn't just download um, a table to their, to their computer. Are there any questions on access management here? Oh. So the, the final piece of this um, is analysis, um, and that's kind of where we'll spend the rest of our time. Um, Rediviz offers a scalable compute platform for tabular geospatial and unstructured data. It's a place where um, Researchers can go to filter, aggregate, and join data, either through a graphical interface or through SQL, or kind of mix and matching the two. Um, and then you can analyze and visualize the data in R, Python, Stata, and SAS notebooks. This all happens within a collaborative environment where you can kind of share your project with any of your colleagues um, in a classroom setting with, with kind of anybody else in the class, including from external institutions. Um, and this uh, this environment kind of has reproducibility built in as a natural kind of byproduct of the research process on Rediviz. Uh, and again, there's a robust API that's really designed for interoperability. So with that, um, we can go back to our um, chronological data set that we were looking at before and do a quick analysis of precipitation trends in uh, the United States. So to do that, we will create a new project. Oops. And we can see here, so this is the project interface. This is where researchers um, can perform analysis. Um, we're looking at the same data set that we were before, yet by default, we bring in um, a 1% sample of the data set. Um, to highlight the performance characteristics of the system, we will work with the full data set today. Um, this is, you know, I think a few hundred gigabytes, uh, three billion records in this in this main table. So our first step in our analysis is going to be to reduce this daily observations table to the observations that we actually care about. Um, so if we look here, we can see that what they basically done is stack every weather observation into a single table. So we have precipitation, we have min max temperature, we have snowfall, what have you. Um, so let's begin by just kind of doing something simple and pulling out the precipitation observations from this table. To do that, we'll create a transform. 
Um, and in this fairly trivial transform, um, all that we need to do is filter rows, keeping those where the element equals the RCP. And then finally, we can choose which variables we want to propagate from um, the input table to the output table. In this case, we can choose the station identifier, the date of the observation, and the observed value of precipitation. Let's go ahead and run this transform. Um, this is operating on 3 billion records. The output table will be close to a billion. Um, usually, it's about 10 to 20 seconds to execute, um, which is quite a bit faster um, than kind of most, um, you know, something like Stata or R or Python. Um, I should mention that all of this is being um, transposed to SQL behind the scenes. So um, this is obviously very important for reproducibility purposes. If um, you are somebody who knows SQL or prefer to work in SQL, you can also just go in here and start, start writing SQL um, and skip the interface. So there we have it. We have our output table um, with uh, the weather station ID, the calendar date, the observed value, um, and the 960 million observations that we expected. Um, our next step is going to be to annualize the data. So uh, precipitation cycles, at least kind of, um, kind of a back of the envelope way, are, um, are an annual cycle. Um, so to do that, we will create another transform. Um, and in this transform, we will start by creating a new variable where we extract the year. We extract the year from the calendar date. And then to annualize the data, to aggregate the data, we're going to create what we call a partitioned variable. Um, let's call this annual precipitation, where we compute a running sum by each station, by each year. We'll compute the sum for that station for that year of precipitation. And then we can drop to quick bits to collapse our results. And then finally, we'll choose our output table. So again, we're going to want the station identifier, the calendar year, and the annual precipitation for that year. And I can go ahead and run this transform. And again, we can see the code that's being generated behind the scene. And we have just written the SQL um, if we if that worked for. Give that a quick second. There we go. Um, and so there we have our output table, we have the station ID, we have the year, we have the annual precipitation. Um, all these zeros are coming up at the top, but that doesn't really reflect the real data. Um, we can compute summary statistics as we, as we go. Um, and this is really helpful for just validating our work and kind of making sure that our data pipelines are doing what we expect them to and that kind of our output data at least passes um, the basic snuff test. Um, what we see here is that our average rainfall per station is 7,600. This is in tenths of a millimeter. So uh, we're looking at 76 centimeters per year per weather station. That at least sounds vaguely right. So we have a reasonable degree of confidence that things are working. Um, we can also see that the data aren't perfect. We have negative values for precipitation in here, um, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, it's not very common. Our mean is definitely a positive number. Um, but as we all know, when we're working with data, things are really perfect. And really, this, this interface provides mechanisms for you to kind of understand what's going on, understand the quality of the data, and potentially go back upstream um, and, and, and change your analysis. Um, but for the sake of this demo today, we'll, we'll keep pressing forward. Um, so we have our annual rainfall per year per weather station. And um, the final step in this data transformation process is going to be to bring in the latitude and longitude information. And to do that, we're going to join in another table the stations table from the um, GHCM daily weather data set. And we will join these two tables on the unique identifier for each weather station. And now, in addition to all of the variables from our source table, we can also propagate things from the stations table, most notably the latitude and longitude. I should mention, so here we're just joining uh, two tables within the same data set. Um, I can add any number of data sets that I have access to on Redditors to this project. And I can perform joins across those tables. Um, these could be data sets hosted for Carnegie Mellon. These could be data sets hosted um, elsewhere. As long as you have access, you can bring them in here um, and, and combine the different data sets together. So there we have it. Uh, we have uh, each station by year, the presentation and its latitude and longitude. Um, and the kind of final piece of this pipeline is going to be to visualize um, this output table in a notebook. Um, so we're going to go ahead and spin up a quick 
um, a Python and notebook to um, to work with this table. Um, notably, so we started with you know billions of records in the source and bringing billions of records into a, a Python um, notebook, bringing them in memory um, is generally not the best idea on most computational systems. But we were able to use this data transformation interface to kind of define inclusion and exclusion criteria, aggregate data, join data to a more um, reasonable size that we can now pull in for further analysis. Um, so by default, this is just bringing in the top thousand rows to a data frame. Let's go ahead and pull this all together. The nice thing about this all happening on the cloud um, is that things are quite fast in terms of networking. So it's still 3 million records that pulled um, right into the notebook. Um, I am not going to attempt to code live here, um, but we can do a little bit of uh, Panda's uh, data frame manipulation just to get um, a third year deviation um, in, uh, in precipitation from our source data. And then we'll use Plotly to draw this on the map. And there we have it. Um, we can see some of the precipitation trends in the United States. Southwest is getting drier. Parts of the Midwest are actually getting a bit wetter. Um, and of course, you know, at this point, this is just a Python workspace. There are notebooks, there are state and SAS notebooks. Um, and so you can install any number of dependencies that you would like to work with um, for the particular notebook environment um, and, and kind of use the, the full data science toolkit that's available there. Um, to give you a sense of how notebooks might be used in maybe a slightly more computationally robust way, um, I do have this one last example. Of, um, this is kind of an unstructured data set or semi-structured data set um, that contains a bunch of chest x-ray data. Um, this is from a paper published, I think, around 10 years ago. Um, and uh, the original data for this paper, um, so it's a bunch of chest x-rays that have been labeled um, with demographic characteristics of the patients. And the original imaging data was basically just distributed through this box folder. There's a readme, there's a bunch of zipped image files. Um, the kudos to the authors for making this available, um, but obviously this is a little bit tricky to work with. Um, so we have brought this particular data set into Redivis, um, where we see that we have all of the imaging data um, available as files in here. Um, but notably, we can also kind of treat them in a semi-structured way in that we have these images, but we also have um, metadata about the images. So uh, for what we see here is, you know, for a given image, we have um, particular uh, patient demographic characteristics, as well as the finding labels um, for, um, for that radiology scan. So, you know, whether there's a negative finding or kind of these, these various um, pulmonary conditions. And so what we can do with this data set um, is we can bring it in to a project um, that we created here. This is a, a featured project on the demo organization. Um, to uh, look at um, cardiomegaly, so an oversized heart um, in these radiology scans, and ultimately train a convolutional neural network using TensorFlow um, to um, kind of detect uh, cardiomegaly in these images. Um, and so there's kind of some various work happening um, upstream here where uh, we define kind of our training and validation set, um, but ultimately these, um, these files all come down to this image classifier notebook, um, where we're able to load in the data, define various um, model parameters, and ultimately uh, train a model um, that um, can be used to, to classify uh, cardiomegaly in images and um, evaluate the results. And you can see here, again, this is very back of the envelope, but we can see here that the, the model performs um, reasonably well at identifying um, this condition. So in summary, uh, Redivis makes it easy for researchers to upload, find, access, and dive into their data. Um, it has built-in compliance and auditability for high-risk data sets. It provides interoperability via um, an API and integration with open source tools, um, and really um, allows for reproducible research to be a natural output of the process. So all data sets are version controlled. Every project defines the series of steps that were taken to kind of create data derivatives and output tables and final analyses, um, and kind of really trying to push things into kind of a, a more kind of fair and open um, data science ecosystem. Um, 
So with that, we have just had this last slide. Melanie, I don't know if you want to present this about the CMU trial, what it is. Sure, thank you. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we have a trial for Redivis that goes now through December 2020, sorry, 2024. And during this trial, um, you're welcome to put up to one terabyte of data onto the platform, try it out. Anything larger than one terabyte, we just want to have a conversation with you before and um, determine on a case-by-case -case basis what we can actually accommodate um, in terms of these very large data sets. Um, but please reach out if your data set is larger than one terabyte because we might be able to accommodate that. And so to get started with the trial, um, please feel free to send me a message in the chat right now, or you can contact Lu Ling or me via email at any point. Um, and we can, oh, sorry, there is a typo in my email address there, but it's andrew.cmu.edu. And um, we can um, give you access to the platform and set up an onboarding meeting with you if you'd like to um, go over how to get started again. And there's also this website that has some resources on it for getting started. There's some tutorials and some videos from Rediviz, um, so you can remind yourself about some of these features as you play around with it. Um, and we will also send this recording out afterwards. And so with that, um, we do have time to take more questions if anyone has any questions. Okay, great. Uh, Melia, I have more of a comment than, than a question. I just want to make sure that any researchers that are gonna be using the system to share any of your data that you are making sure that you're only sharing data that you have permission to share, whether that's a contractual agreement that's been signed um, or if it's um, data that's been collected using an approved IRB and the consent form that the subject signed gave you permission to share the data and make it pub publicly available. Just make sure that you have any necessary permissions in place before you do share any, any of the data. Yes, thank you so much for um, mentioning that. And um, Lu Ling, is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, not at this point. And I'll just say, um, as you try it out, um, we really do welcome any feedback you might have about the platform. So please feel free to get in touch with us and let us know what you think. Um, this feedback is really valuable as we um, determine how to proceed with the license at the end of the trial period. So we really appreciate any feedback you're willing to give us. Um, I, have a, I have a question. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Sure. Uh, I think it's for Ian. Um, my question is about um, the, uh, the likelihood um, and the sort of track record uh, uh, Redivis and reducing contracting frictions with uh, with third parties. So here's a kind of problem that we face um, quite a bit. Um, I'm Chris Tomer. I'm uh, a faculty computing representative from the Tepper School, the business school here at CMU. Um, so we'll get some uh, um, uh, some research funding or something like that, and it'll come along with uh, some sensitive data. And then uh, we'll have to sign contracts. Um, our contracting people here will contract with, ever, with uh, whomever is providing the data. And those, um, those sort of contracting negotiations uh, inevitably come down to, okay, how are you going to store the data? Um, and then uh, you know, a bunch of technical um, discussion in terms of uh, security and so on and so forth. And, and they can take an awful long time. And... Uh, um, and can be uh, pretty torturous. So I, I guess my question is about um, Edifice, um becoming a norm uh, in this uh, in this kind of context, or is it likely to become a norm such that we can just say to the third party, um, we're going to put the data on Redivis, and uh, um, and that's going to reduce uh, the uh, the complexity of the sort of um, situation by situation uh, contracting in terms of the data storage? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, 
that would definitely make my life a lot easier too. Um, I would love to see kind of a world where this becomes more normative. You know, I, I don't think we're there yet. Um, that said, our, so our team has a lot of experience in um, kind of working through these security questionnaires that kind of inevitably arise as part of the contracting process. And I do think on, on your end, it can make things quite a bit easier in ultimately deferring um, some of those questions to us. Um, so, so I think, you know, we're, we're getting there. there. There is a lot that you can point to. Rediviz, um, I think to date still might be the only cloud solution for CMS, so Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services. Um, we're hosting their 20% data cut through Stanford. That was like a big thing beforehand. You basically had to go to Maryland to work with the data or VPN into Maryland. Um, so, so there are a lot of examples where, you know, very high risk data are being hosted on Rediviz. Um, I, I have not seen particular data vendors be willing to kind of take prior art as, you know, an example uh, or as kind of, okay, now you don't have to fill out the form. Um, but, but hopefully kind of the, the world can evolve in that direction. Thank you. Yeah. Can I ask a question to build on that? And, and I apologize if, if this is super obvious and I missed it, but would Carnegie Mellon be hosting its own data on Redivis or would be, we be able to use it to host third-party data? So if we did acquire data from some company um, or hospital system or another researcher, would we put that data on Redivis or would it just be our own data that we've collected? Or is that a determination I I, that we make? <laughs> like, yeah, I, I guess I don't want to answer her Carnegie Mellon policy. That said, we do have a lot of, um, those are some of our earliest examples. Um, so that particular group at, center, at Stanford, the Center for Population Health Sciences, um, most, if not all of their data sets. Um, so they have this uh, this market scan data set, it's an insurance claims data set that they have procured and are hosting through Reddit is. Um, so so it's, so it's not their there. data that they've collected, it's data that they have purchased or acquired from someone else. It's somebody else's data. Somebody else owns that data. Exactly, exactly. Okay. And so there's in nothing in like, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, please. There's nothing in the Redivis terms of use or the Redivis contract that Carnegie Mellon would enter into that would preclude us from putting someone else's data on Redivis' site. Because some, sometimes you see um, situations where we would only be allowed to put something we owned up there, but you, that's not the case here. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that. Um, yeah. And then do you, yeah. do you have examples of how Stanford or maybe other academic institutions or other research institutions might control access internally? So in the case that Jen mentioned where somebody maybe has an IRB protocol that limits the sharing, the further sharing or use of that data set, you know, how do institutions control who can access the data? Yeah, so I, I do think this, this particular group, and this is something that you can... Um, look at yourself, um, all of the kind of the access information is, is public. Um, so redivis.com slash Stanford PHS, and we can kind of include it in the follow-up email. Um, but if, if you go to this page, um, for, for you, this will say apply for access and kind of a big red button. Um, and so you can see how they are, um, this is what we looked at before, right? So you can see how they're managing access here. Um, and so, you know, they have, you know, IRB approval, what have you. Um, the, the systems, you know, again, very, very flexible, but the particular need that um, PHS had was, you know, they have, I think, close to 2000 researchers now who are working with their data. Um, and these data come, these data sets come with all sorts of contractual requirements, right? Um, and they don't have a personal relationship or the data manager doesn't have a personal relationship with everybody that's working with the data. So what this system allowed them to do was kind of define the rules that were required for different tiers of access, you know, based on their contractual obligations, um, and basically ensure that everybody um, that can touch the data is um, kind of fully compliant with those terms, because by definition, they have completed all these requirements, that requirement has been approved by an administrator, um, that requirement has not since expired. So there is an administrator on the back end reviewing who's requesting access to each of these data sets. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can configure requirements so they auto approve on submission. So if you just want to co collect some you know, demographic information or whatnot, you could do that. But of course, for a high-risk data set, um, you would want somebody on the back end who is you know, validating that um, the submissions are um, correct or appropriate. 
there are other workflows that we've seen. Um, I think the um, business school at, at Stanford is doing this a little bit. I think um, some groups like Columbia, where you know, if you have an external system that, that's some sort of like kind of group work group access directory manager, um, you could use our API to kind of assign access um, based on that system. Um, so that's a little bit more like high touch, but um, there are kind of different workflows that you could use there as well. Thank you. Any other questions? Any I have like another one, yeah, yeah. Um, but I don't want to uh, step on anybody else's toes who uh, hasn't had a chance to go yet. I, I'd like to try my question again, um, and I'm going to just be more specific. I mean, I think I pretty much got the, the gist of the answer. It, it kind of builds on what Julia just said. Here, here's a, a specific situation. Um, we contract with a third-party data provi provider um, to license the data that they're going to uh, give to us. So uh, who owns it? Um, uh, no, um, they own it. We license it. We have uh, the rights to do certain things with it. They make us uh, um, get our computing group to essentially build a server to, uh, to um, uh, satisfy certain security protocols. And contracting of that and then the labor required to, uh, to build the server to satisfy these security protocols um, was kind of big. So here's my question. Uh, if we're a Redivus uh, subscriber, can I just punt that to you guys and say, um, I want to put the data on Redivus um, and uh, call up Ian and uh, he's going to uh, uh, tell you what security pro protocols, because I don't know this stuff, uh, right. that, that, are, that are there. And um, he's going to work with you to find a solution or maybe there's no solution, but uh, at any rate, um, uh, this is the kind of service that uh, you would provide if we were a yeah yeah absolutely so that's yeah that's the thing that we have experience with and where we kind of take that load from you um and, and I should have said in a lot of cases we can expedite things like we have a slot two report for Redivis we have penetration testing reports we have all sorts of documentation that's ready to go you know and basic things like encryption and transit and arrest and full documentation and data disaster recovery so. So yeah, because we we've, we've kind of done this many times, um, you absolutely can and, and should just punt those questions to us that are about kind of the technical capabilities and security, you know, uh, framework of the right of the system, and then we can provide all the documentation around that to the vendor. Well, that would be a value add there. Thank you. That's helpful yeah. to know. Does anybody have specific questions about, I don't know, the, the data sets that they have for their research and different data types that would be helpful to, to dig into? It is right after lunch. That's it. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So Brian um, brings up a great point. Is there anything else to add about um, using it for teaching or did any, I think there is one person on the call that was maybe interested in using it for instructional purposes. So I'm not sure there's any questions related to that, but I can imagine that might be a case where you're using a data set that doesn't, you didn't generate yourself. Um, right, well. right. Um, yeah, yeah. Sorry. That's, that's a great question. And um, I guess we didn't drill too much into those use cases. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, this is this is designed to be a collaborative environment, which um, is obviously, you know, important um, for um, for you know, research collaborators. Um, but it also really opens up a lot of possibilities for instruction. Um, so, um, you know, in a classroom setting, you could host you know the data sets that are associated with you know a particular problem set or unit or, or the class as a whole. Um, that could all be hosted on Redivis with the documentation, with kind of like everything that we've seen here, um, configuring access um, as needed. So maybe this probably for a classroom setting is just completely public, um, or maybe you just restrict it to members of the class. Um, and um, you could use it simply as a distribution tool. So people can, you know, download the data set from here. Um, you know, and any table on Redivis can just be, just be downloaded. Um, uh, but I think kind of where the, the real power lies in allowing for um, 
you know, um, students to spin up quick projects where they can explore the data. Um, so let me just hop over to the project that we just created here. Um, so you can provide um, uh, template projects as well for, for a classroom. So you could um, feature certain projects that do some you know, basic cutting and analysis. Um, and then anybody with read access to that project can go in and fork it. So kind of just create their own their own branch of the project as it was at a given point in time. Um, you can share this project with your collaborators. You can make it completely public. Um, anybody with edit access can come in here. It's kind of like a Google Doc. You can work in real time. Um, we can you know leave comments to each other as we go. Um, and then I, I think one of the the really nice things um, for kind of an, in, in kind of an introductory to, to data science framework um is these um is these computational notebooks um there's a lot that a lot of pain that can happen in you know kind of getting a python environment for example set up on you know everybody in the classroom's computer um and a lot of you know it works on my computer not on yours but dependencies are installed stuff like that um and uh this kind of interface really allows for students to quickly get into um, analytical workflows. So these, um, you know, this comes pre-installed with the data science toolkit in Python. Um, you can install any number of dependencies um, to go alongside the, the notebook as well. Um, and then again, kind of, you know, it's it's reproducible. So a student can run a run, you know, particular analysis and somebody else can come in there, build on that, get the same results and, and what have you. Great, thank you. Um, so with that, we have a few more minutes if anybody has any last questions. I should mention, um, I think one example of this um, is a, a, a group at Georgetown. Um, uh, they spun up this uh, green space challenge. We can maybe include this in the, in the slide deck. Um, but this was kind of like a data science hackathon that they used Redivis for. Um, they had um, an organization that they created um, that, um, sorry. Um, so they created this organization where they were hosting a bunch of data sets around uh, various kind of environmental um, and climatological indicators um, that. Um, that you know they gave people access to, and um, members of this challenge would uh, publish you know their projects that would then be for, you know go for review. And there's actually like the cash prize for some of like the top uh, projects and analyses that were produced as part of this challenge. Um, so I, I think this is maybe a really good um, effort to to lean on in terms of thinking about writers for um, instructional settings. Cool. Thank you. Um... Yeah, so with that, I've already heard, already heard from some folks, but if you um, think about it and you want to try out the platform, just get in touch with Luling or me, and we can help you get set up with an account. Um, Luling also just shared our libguide in the chat. This is just all of our resources um, that might be useful for you <clears throat> as you start to try it out. Um, and with that, thank you so much for attending. and. Again, always happy to get feedback. So please reach out if anything. Hey, Melanie, um, could you point us to uh, where a copy of this video is going to be so that we can pass it along to our colleagues who weren't able to come today? You can oh, yeah. send an email send, or whatever. I'll send it out in an email. Yeah. Great. Thanks very much. Yep, of course. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Ian. Thank you, Melanie Luling, for organizing. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for everyone um, being here.